good afternoon ladies and gentlemen a warm welcome to you and to you mr alphonse we are delighted to have you with us the foreign correspondents club is a 60 year old organization and this is the 60th year and the vice president came and launched our 60th anniversary celebrations and we are going to organize several meetings inviting editors from the south asian region and from the world a lot of other activities are going to be taking place this will happen and we'll be delighted to collaborate with the uh, ministry of tourism and the government of india in future friends uh, <coughs> i don't really need to introduce you to the minister because he's, a, he's been a formidable civil servant and uh, he used to be known as the demolition man when he was a commissioner of the dda in delhi because he uh, pulled down more than 14000 illegal encroachments he belongs to the uh, kerala cadre of the ias and in kottayam he made history by making it the first 100% literacy town then the same thing was done uh, in the rest of the state he has published two books one, he one is that okay the uh, website says two are anyway no. and um, he retired in 2006 and he has been a member of the legislative assembly of kerala for a term and uh, he joined the bjp before the elections uh, last elections and he is now minister of state with the independent charge of uh, the ministry of tourism tourism is uh, one of the major uh, priority areas of the present day government and we are getting more than 10 million tourists but more than 20 million indians go abroad on travel and uh, even cities like bangkok get more than 20 million tourists then you have paris london new york which also get more than 15 million tourists we have one of the oldest civilizations in this country and we have everything a tourist can look for so we would like to know about the efforts the government of india is making and the ministry is making his ministry is making to bring more foreign tourists to india and if he has any policy statements to make we look forward to listening to them the floor is yours mr alphonse uh thank you vagant uh thank you for inviting me here uh of course i've been here before twice when i was commissioner dda so it's a familiar place um i'm very happy to be here um let me give you an overall uh, picture of uh, tourism scenario uh 2017 has been an amazing year for indian tourism we had uh, 10.1 million uh, foreign tourists arriving here and actually if i take also the nris people with of indian origin it adds up to 16.5 million actually people i mean that's the international calculation 16.5 million people arrived in india so we had a uh, 15.67% growth in 2017 compared to the average global growth rate of 5% in 2017 and our revenue receipts from foreign tourists it uh, went up by 20.8% uh, which is about four times more than what is the global uh, increase uh, we had a revenue of 27 billion dollars from foreign tourists alone um, in 2017 which approximately is about 1 lakh 80000 crores um, so this is a scenario for foreign tourists uh domestic tourism has been actually much more vibrant in 2017 we had 1.8 billion not million billion trips made by indians because that's why we calculate um uh so which is of course been a huge generator of uh, jobs in the country so as of today uh tourism provides about 7% to the gdp of the country we provide about uh 14% of the jobs total jobs in the country is provided by tourism uh now the big take during the past 4 years is tourism has created 14.62 million jobs between 2014 to 
18. In four and a half years, four years actually, it's created 14.62 million jobs. So I think this has been the big take from, uh, from uh, the tourism ministry because uh, there's been, of course, allegations that there is, it's, a, it's been a jobless growth. India is the fastest growing economy in the world, but jobs are being created, but jobs are being created and millions of jobs are being created. Another great thing about tourism is that this is a, uh, somewhere everybody is taken care of, the illiterate people, to the semi-literate, to school dropout, to graduates, to postgraduates, to MBAs. Everybody has a role in tourism. We employ people from all segments of society. So I think it's a great equalizer, tourism ministry. And the multiplier effect of tourism is, a, is the greatest. For every rupee spent, we are told that there is something like four rupees payback. So the, great, the best sector to invest really is the tourism um, industry. Now, my effort has been basically uh, two things. One is to create basic infrastructure in India at our tourist destinations. We have 36 UNESCO monuments. We have over 6,500 protected monuments in this country. We have 8,000 kilometers of the sea coast with wonderful beaches. We have the backwaters of Kerala. We have the tropical forests, wonderful hills. We have a uh, humpy, the, the enormous capital of uh, Vijayanagar Empire, which is still a whole lot of stuff there is very much intact. Uh, going up, coming up north, of course, we have um, Chhatrapati Shivaji's uh, famous fortresses, very, very large numbers, which are about 300. I visited only really one of them, the Raigar one. Then coming to Rajasthan, we have these amazing fortresses, old palaces converted into the best luxury hotels in the world. Of course, you have the luxury on wheels. You have these luxury trains running now, five of them running to various destinations, which is the ultimate in luxury. Then, of course, something which a lot of people don't know, we have 73% of the Himalayas is in, uh, uh, is in India. And you have these incredible northeastern states, eight of them, which is completely unexplored, which is amazingly beautiful. India has fantastic, most vibrant dance and music, art forms, um, most amazing cuisine. And uh, I, mean, I was just mentioning to somebody, you go to a five-star hotel abroad, and uh, at breakfast they will ask you, you want uh, toast and uh, Omelette or omelette or, or, and toast. That's a choice is offered. I was staying in one of the super five-star hotels in New York this time. You go to one of our hotels here, I mean, you'll see a 100 meter spread. And the kind of hospitality which you see. Again, on the last trip to the US, I was staying in one of the, one of the five-star hotels in a presidential suite. I called for the water, and they said, you can come and collect it from the, from, from the counter. I mean, compare this to the kind of hospitality which Indian hotels provide. I think it's just fantastic, amazing. Our uh, heritage sites, Taj is amazing. It's a jewel in the crown, but we have 10 things as good as a Taj. Take, for example, Kajrao, built between the 9th and the 11th century. The east wing and two wings there are. There are 82 temples in the complex. And of course, there are five of these temples in one of the complex, which is fantastically completely intact, a few hundred meters tall, amazing architecture with no steel or cement used, and completely hand-carved with, with amazing um, you know, sculpture. I mean, I'm awestruck going to these places. I was in Sarnath the other day, the stupa, and that whole place, it is incredible. Um, I went to the Raigar fort. I mean, you think that you're just going to come across the fortress now, and then you cross mountain ranges and mountain ranges. Finally, you come to the last one, and there you see 3,000 feet up there, the Raiga Fort. We have incredible stuff here. Now, we are a 5,000-year-old civilization. It's a living civilization. That's why our new slogan is, we don't say, visit India. We don't even say, experience India. We say, come and be transformed, because you will never be the same once you come to India. So. We are trying to create infrastructure. We uh, have uh, 68 projects under the Swadesh Darshan scheme to create basic infrastructure around uh, the monuments. We are spending about 6,500 crores on that. We also have the Prasad scheme for creating infrastructure around the religious sites and heritage sites. We have uh, about 25 projects where we are spending about 700 crores. 
But we are doing much more this year on one thing, in promotion of India abroad. I have close to $100 million on uh, promoting India abroad. That's quite a bit of money, which is the uh, Prime Minister has been very kind. We are holding road shows all across the world. We just finished the one in the US, next is uh, Russia and the Nordic countries. And then after that, I go to China. Um, so some of these countries which we think are important, we are having the road shows, meeting people, meeting people of Indian origin and saying, come back to roots. This is what the Prime Minister also said, go abroad and see, but also please see India, bring them back to roots. Uh, so we're promoting among NRIs, people of Indian origin in a big way. But a big, big change has been our promotionals. I don't know how many of you have seen our promotionals. Our new promotions are only all 60 seconds. And it's, everything has got a storyline. Take our promotional on yoga. We had had 35 million views. Now, we beat, I think, both Apple and Samsung. We put out our uh, promotional on uh, uh, Ayurveda a few days back. In 10 days, we had 7 million views. I'm not talking about hit 7 million views. We put up one on luxury, which had millions of views. We are translating all these promotionals into various languages, nine languages. We are putting them across in all the social media in all the countries. We are uh, actually also telecom uh, advertising on prime time in all the television channels. So this is a big thing we do. We are flooding the world with India. With India. And if you see the no, new promotions, I mean, we have new ideas. Take, for example, yoga, which we think is the crux of Indian civilization. And what is that? It's simple. You and I are one. The entire humanity is one. We go beyond that and see the entire universe is one. Therefore, happiness is indivisible. You can't say, I, my family is going to be happy. I think we're just talking about the entire happiness of the world. We are also talking about preservation of the universe because the universe is part of me. And if you see the, the promotional, and it's very simple, Yogi of the Racetrack is the, is the name we given. You can YouTube it, Yogi of the Racetrack. We thought, a lot of people thought that yoga was for people who are retired, who have nothing else to do. Here is a 20-year-old millennial. He's a motorcycle racer. And uh, it's a story. It has a storyline. And he says, yoga has taught me more about life and about motorcycles. <laughs> Only about. And the final punchline is, the more still you are, the further you go. So just see it. I mean, you, you will love it. Everybody loves this. And uh, our, um, again, our, our Ayurveda promotional. Again, it derives from the yogic philosophy that we are part of the world. And if we are part of the world, then the cure for you, your wellness doesn't lie in some chemical factory. It's right here in the universe. It has products which can cure you. So we've taken this huge new line of promotionals, which is going to flood the world, let people get to know. And uh, so that's the whole line we are taking. Well, the Prime Minister's Swaj Bharat has made dramatic changes in India in terms of cleanliness. India has built 75 million toilets over the past four and a half years, which has made a dramatic change. Some of our cities which were considered not clean earlier take indoor. It's today the cleanest city in the country. Vishakhapatnam, Tharamsala. So these are some of the municipal corporations which have taken the lead of the, from the Prime Minister and have dramatically changed uh, their uh, municipal areas. So it's made dramatic changes. Yes, India can be cleaner, no doubt from that. Any country can be cleaner. So uh, this uh, entire Swaj Bharat effort is we are going to take it to people, destinations involving also tourists. So these are some of the big takes. We've requested the states to have specialized uh, tourism police so that you know, they would be better trained, be able to communicate with tourists better, and possibly also people who can speak some bit of English or some of the foreign language so that they could uh, be a more friendly police force. Now, as of today, 14 states have some form of uh, uh, tourism police, but actually they need to be more empowered so that they would really be able to take better care of the tourists. So these are some of the takeaways. And uh, cruise tourism is an area where we are putting huge focus. Uh, my ministry alone is spending about 100 crores on uh, cruise tourism, building cruise jetties. We are building a beautiful one in Mumbai. 
And in fact, the shipping ministry is also putting in big money, 250 crores of their own money they are putting in to build a huge cruise tourism plus entertainment complex at the Mumbai, Arp Mumbai port. We built a cruise tourism um, jetty in, uh, in um, Goa, Margoa. We built one in Cochin. We are building a second one in Cochin at a cost of 23 crores. We have built one in Chennai. We are on the way to building one in Vaishak. So this is, we believe that cruise tourism is, a, is, is an area where we need a bigger pie. Globally, there are 26 million cruisers globally. And uh, India's share uh, is only 1,74,000 last year, So which is uh, abysmally low. We want large numbers of cruise tours to come in India. So we're creating these huge facilities. We are also planning a river cruise, um, a cru uh, cruise on, uh, on the Brahmaputra from Calcutta right up to Varanasi. So that will start operations uh, soon enough. So these are some of the initiatives we are taking. We are working with the state governments, encouraging them to go out, propagate themselves abroad. So a lot of state governments are also um, taking their uh, states abroad and, and having it on the, on, the, on the big screen. So we're very happy with what's happening, of course. Am I happy with what's happened? No. I want the numbers to double in three years. I want the revenues to double in three years. I want my fo foreign tourist arrivals, that is international tourist arrivals, to reach 30 million in three years. I want the revenues to touch about $55 billion in three years. In five years, I want to touch $100 billion. This is my objective, because we are an incredible civilization, living civilization, and these numbers which we have are not good enough. As Wengert said, many cities get, many countries get much larger numbers, and India with its incredible civilization, which is a living civilization, why shouldn't we get more? We are also promoting adventure tourism in a big way in the Himalayas. I mean, there is rafting, paragliding, trekking, cycling, of course, hardcore mountaineering, everything is available in India. So these are some of the things we are working on. Of course, another big area of focus is a Buddhist circuit. Buddha lived all his life in India, in two states of India, um, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. So we are, I've taken it up with the roads ministry, transport ministry to create a uh, four lane um, connection, connecting all these points um, on the Buddhist circuit. We have a, a good airport in uh, Varanasi, which is under uh, Sarnath is just next to that. So we're going to begin with promoting Sarnath in a big way. And on the 22nd to 25th of next month of August, we are having the International Buddhist Conclave, which is held once in two years. This is going to be held in Delhi and Aurangabad. So, of course, we'll be taking people to Ajanta, to um, Sarnath, to Bodh Gaya, and all these places would be covered. So this is from 22nd of next month to the 25th of next month is uh, International Buddhist Conclave. And for the first time in India, we're going to have India International Tourism Mart. It's the first time. And that's going to be from the 16th to the 18th of September. So we expect to have a very large number of global players, travel agents, travel writers, tour operators. Um, we expect about 400 people, delegates from across the world to come and uh, um, participate in the, in the international tourism, India International Tourism Mart, first one. And it will be held in Vigyan Bhavan, with of course exhibitions from all the tour operators in India, but from all the states. So that's going to be hopefully a big success, draws a large number of people to India. So this is broadly what is tourism and uh, we'll would be very happy to interact with you and uh, get your questions. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, Deepak. Take the microphone, identify yourself, and then put the question. Thanks. Good, good afternoon, sir. My name is Deepak Karora. I missed your meeting in New York City. And I want to say that your best brand ambassador for Indian tourism is our Prime Minister Modi. You know. Yes, he's, you know. the, he's the best brand ambassador. You should have. So I it's wish, made my wish, job so much easier. Yeah, I wish you were there in, uh, you know, Madison Square Garden and th those auditoriums to listen to what he, how he promoted it. I know, I've, I've listened it live. Okay. I mean, All right, I, sir. Now, my yeah. question comes to be a little difficult one, sir. Uh, the other day, Supreme Court gave his observations on Taj Mahal. I would suggest that if you, if you 
think that you, can, you are not able to maintain it, protect it, why should we demolish it? Why don't you lease it to, let's say, France, you know, which is good in maintaining their heritage? If you look into the Eiffel Tower the other day, I mean, we, I got a WhatsApp message yesterday or today. They celebrated their World Cup victory for the beautiful fireworks on Eiffel <coughs> Tower. Now, the chances of winning or losing were 50-50, but they were prepared for that night. All right. So why can't we plan something where we can put India into a different league, you know? That's my first, first question. Can Second, I answer that? Because otherwise I might forget. Now, I completely agree with you. We can't really run the Taj the way it's being run. That city is in a bad shape. It needs to be so much better. But of course, Taj is a Taj. It's the most beautiful monument in the world. I'm sure the Supreme Court is, uh, uh, like everybody Indian, would be very sensitive to the whole idea of the Taj getting, uh, you know, discolored, disfigured. And uh, see, day for us today, I guess we got a Supreme Court order, the remarks. From Yesterday, one of the senior most ministers in the cabinet, along with three other ministers, sat through for a long time and they've come out with a plan. So this government has been hugely responsive to any such suggestions. We want to ensure that the Taj continues to be the jewel in our crown, and they have planned out. They have a whole lot of stuff. I mean, today's newspaper has a report. So our hash action has been immediate. We have been doing things, but you see, the whole problem with Taj, let me tell you, Agra city needs to be completely be transformed. That is the issue. That is the issue. I mean, I've been there many times. You go on the highway, on the expressway, the moment you land in Agra, you see that things need to be different. I think this is where the municipal corporation, the state government needs to come on board. <clears throat> we are willing to put in money. State government, I'm told, is, has announced that they're willing to put in big money. 400 crores they had announced. I think all these need to work together with the municipal body and ensure that it is neat and clean and there is less pollution there. And that city needs to be, needs to be a lot better. Yeah. Right, sir. My other question is, uh, that Supreme Court also uh, observed, gave its observation on lynching, you know. Pardon? Oh, lynching. Mob lynching and, and then, of course, there were incidents on the highways where people, I would call people as tourists, you know, getting killed, you know. When you're moving from place A to place B, you become a tourist, whether you're Indian or you're a foreign citizen, you know. It doesn't matter. I'm saying these are the negative stories. That these are the negative stories which bring bad name to India, whether it is lynching, mob killing, or killings on the highways, or rapes for that matter, you know. One rape and it, head, it headlights. It bring all your efforts down to zero or to negative. So, so my question to you is, like you mentioned other cities, uh, other countries, you know, well, as our President Venkat mentioned, what is it we need to do so that we ensure that we get continuous uh, tourists from abroad to our country. See, number one, I think we need to have tourism in our DNA. I think that's extremely important. I think this is a responsibility of the citizen that every tourist who comes to India, whether it is a foreigner or it's an Indian traveling within India, must feel hugely welcome. So we need to get this to tourism into our DNA. I think it's extremely important. Number two, incidents which are happened, which are happening. These are extremely unfortunate, unacceptable. But let me tell you, I think the foreign media has been hugely discriminatory. I use that word discriminatory. I mean, I have another better word for that. For um, I don't want to use that. You possibly know exactly the word I'm trying to use. Hugely discriminatory. I don't want to compare numbers. I don't want to say your New York City has more incidents. I don't want to say your Paris has more incidents. I don't want to say London has more incidents. I don't want to, I don't want to do these comparisons because any such an incident is bad. But I think, take for example the report that India is the most unsafe country for, for uh, women travelers. Now, we asked the Thomson Reuters Foundation. They said they have done an interview with, survey with 548 people. We said, would you give us a list of these people? They said, sorry, no. They said they considered 43 so-called women activists. Now, we said, can you give us a list of these people? No. What kind of survey did they do? What kind of survey? Come on, I live here. We live here. 
When I was in Berlin about a month back, an American journalist asked me, you had a case of uh, rape in Delhi, so-called Nirbhaya case. I said, your question has the answer. If you're talking about an incident which happened six years back, your question has the answer. And I said, do you want me to tell you exactly how many cases happened in New York last night? I think the global media is hugely discriminatory. It's very unfair. And part of the Indian media is also responsible. When the, the incident of Swiss couple happened in Fatehpur Sikri, the foreign minister of India sent a joint secretary to the place to meet them. I went to the hospital myself and met them. Offered all help. We said, we'll take care of all the medical bills. I said, I offered them rooms in, 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 the, in the Ashoka hotels. Now you tell me any other country which is ever doing that. You tell me a joint secretary going to meet um, you know, somebody who's been a victim of harassment. You tell me a minister going to meet a tourist and offering saying I'll take care of all the treatment. I'm sorry. Just because they consider India to be a backward country, you can write whatever you want. And the so-called 43 women activists from India who were questioned, I mean, who are these so-called women activists? I can, I can assure you these entire 43 would be leftists, hardcore leftists, who do not like my prime minister. And I see Indian media, one moment, Indian media as well. When that incident happened, I had lead articles in three newspapers saying, what a rubbish India is. Come on. You have shootouts happening in New York. You have ha happening things everywhere in the world. I'm sorry, what is happening in India? If this isolated incident, there are isolations happening. These are unfortunate. I'm not justifying. Does any newspaper in the U.S. write an editorial saying that this country is completely unsafe? There was a three-page article about the Fatehpur Sikri incidents in one of the biggest newspapers in the world. I don't want to name the newspaper. I'm sure you know which one. So uh, I have been hearing about the concept of tourist police from the time I was a crime reporter for the Statesman way back in 1993 and we would have these incidents every now and then. Uh, now I work for a Japanese newspaper called the Asahi Shimbun and uh, I can assure you we do very, res very responsible <laughs> reporting. So now uh, only very recently Times of India front paged a story about a Japanese lady who was wronged in Manali. Uh, and she was waiting for a bus, she missed the bus, and she took another uh, car, and she was wronged. Uh, what I want to understand, you mentioned that there are 14 states that have set up tourist police uh, force. Uh, from the time your government has come, you're in the fourth year now, how have you contributed, how has your government contributed to setting up the police force in these, these states that you mentioned? Could you throw some light on it? In fact, I, I had a meeting with the, all the tourism secretaries of the country, and uh, we said, you must persuade your government to have a full-fledged tourism police in every state. We have tourism police or some, some kind of tourism police in 14 states. Now, this won't do. And we also said, select your biggest destinations, like the Taj, like the Fatehpur Sikri, and, and other destinations where a large number of people come. I said, have really specialized people who would be on duty 24 hours. We have requested the states. So, uh, some of them have come online. I think many of them need to because... Um, law and order is a state subject where the center cannot dictate, but we are trying to persuade the states to do that. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, we need to have uh, more professional uh, tourism police. I, I agree. But many other states have improved dramatically their, uh, their policing. And um, see, let me tell you, India is very safe. India is a safe country. It's a country with 1.3 billion people. And if somebody is going to judge India with an isolated incident, which again shouldn't happen, I'm saying it's completely unacceptable, but that is not fair. It's just not fair at all. Yeah. And this, of course, we, we have everything out here. We have a friendly people. We have everything out here. I think we, we just need to project that as a country, as a people. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, I would like to invite your attention that uh, the other day on Saturday, I was attending some program on Ayurveda, and the lecturer, which was giving the lecture, uh, they said that Indian food is a medicinal 
So that, uh, you know, tagline struck me. And uh, I have seen in the newspaper that most of the foreign ladies are coming to India for cookery classes and for, you know, getting some uh, first-hand information about the, uh, the food skills of India. And as we uh, also know, that most of these states have got different foods with different medicinal values. You can start from Kerala to Kashmir, and you, you are well equipped to know about all the medicinal values of the food, as our nannies and nannies have created. So do you uh, give some substance to this point of view in your tourism, when most of the European ladies are flocking down here, and they would like to uh, have the, uh, you know, Yeah, now you see, one of our promotions we have made is on cuisine. India has an amazing cuisine and every state in India has fantastic cuisine. Lot of these, of course, are, have medicinal value. Take, for example, the curry pata. Take, for example, brinjal. I think the whole lot of vegetables which we use obviously have medicinal value. And that's been an, an, uh, an essential part of the Indian cuisine and the variety. You go from state to state, from Kerala to Kashmir, every state has such an incredible spread. And I think, and we made this wonderful movie now, 60 Second Again, which we're just going to release on, on Indian cuisine. Um, yeah, so we, we're doing it in a big way, I think. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. See, there are many places, like in Kerala, I'm aware of it, that there are cookery classes being conducted in in lot of houses in Kerala, it's available. So all these need to be organized systematically. Many hotels are providing. Actually, if you go to some of the hotels in Kerala, they organize uh, uh, culinary uh, classes. But my question is that the tourism from uh, other countries can come and get these dishes. After you give the promotion, and if we can the See, I'm giving the promotional activities. All these promotional activities would lead to the private sector being involved. Like, I'm advertising regarding hospitality. It's not that the government is going to build hospitals at all. No, government is not going to run yoga centers. My thing is, I promote India, I promote yoga, I promote Ayurveda, I promote Indian cuisine, and the supporting system is the private sector. They will create the necessary facilities. Please, no. David, no, no. Please, talk to him later. No, no. David. I can't hear. Yeah. I can't. Maybe I, can just I think that's better. Yeah. So, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you was about the uh, Monument Gitra skin. Yeah. Uh, I think I would like to know what's the situation right now. What are the, uh, are there new MOUs coming? Uh, what's the new development from that uh, area? And the second question was also related to the Monument Gitra skin. Uh, so, I would like to know what's the there is a problem now in India with the way of uh, gestioning or uh, managing the, the patrimony, the heritage sites, or what was the situation? Yeah, see, Monument Mitra is an idea which we came, which we came up with. Because we said India's monuments are, belong to, in, to, to the people of India. It doesn't belong to some, some clerk in a dusty office in the ASI. So he said, these monuments belong to you. So we advertised and said, now come forward, adopt this, take care of this. So it was about citizens' involvement with India's heritage. It's not only the corporate sector. We had the, one of the schools adopting one of the monuments. We are willing to give an adoption to the residents associations. So anybody who is willing to take care of our monuments, we are willing to give to them an adoption. We put in on the website about 100 monuments. We proceeded with a lot of them. Now, uh, I think the controversy came because of the, of the um, Red Fort. Now, we are proceeding with the plan. We are proceeding at a very fast pace. Yes, initially, there were some little problems at the ground level. All the top officials, the minister, everybody, the prime minister was absolutely uh, hugely supportive. But there were some people at the bottom of the ladder who are not extremely happy with anybody else getting involved. Now all that has been sorted out and uh, it's going at a fast pace. And uh, we have put very large number of monuments on adoption. We shall be putting in very large number in the future. So this scheme is going to be uh, you know, one of the main planks of our uh, tourism policy. 
Minister, would you consider giving the Taj Mahal either to the Aga Khan Foundation or the Tatas or a, a big company like that to, main, to maintain it so that they can really do in something? In fact, uh, for in kind information, when got the Taj is also on the list. Why not? If the Colosseum can be adopted by a, by a footwear company, it's being managed by a footwear company, why not the Taj? Why do we assume the people of India won't take responsibility? They will take responsibility. Like the Supreme Court has come down very heavy on us. I think we need to involve citizens, we need to involve NGOs, we need to involve corporate sector, we need to involve people with, the, with expertise, and mind you, we have people with expertise. Now take for example the Humayun tomb. It was, it was done by a foreign foundation, Aga Khan foundation, not even an Indian foundation. And I think they did an excellent job. I think we need involvement, global expertise in doing this kind of things. And mind you, we have expertise in India. Why not? Why not? See, this country doesn't belong to some bureaucrats. I reiterate again, this country belongs to its people, to the people with expertise, with knowledge, to every citizen. So we need to involve citizen in this. Uh, just to take you back, Minister, to the statement that you just made that the foreign media is too discriminatory towards uh, the coverage to uh, the Indian uh, uh, Indian environment. Now, my question is, we should, we need to do something about it, isn't it? We, how are we going to counter this uh, uh, discriminatory uh, publicity uh, to our benefit? I can't change my color. <laughs> now, we are doing plenty. All the people involved at the Fatehpur Sikri incident were immediately arrested. All the people involved when they created trouble for those French couple, French group of people, six of them, they were booked, arrested. Every time there was an incident, people were arrested. We've taken immediate action. We have taken action. And I might tell you, in a massive country like India, there are bound to be very few isolated incidents. We are, we are trying to ensure, every state government is trying to ensure that things are fine, they are get up the police to handle these things. But it's bound to happen. An isolated incident is bound to happen. And if you're going to write a three-page article in your leading newspaper in New York and saying this is the biggest thing that's happening around, forgetting that in your backyard you, had, you, 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 you have a gunning down every, every day happening, I think it's extremely unfair. What do you call that? Do you only call that discriminatory? Yes. See, nobody wants to write. The whole problem is, when I went to visit this couple in the hospital, how many people wrote about that? Did anybody care to write? That the Minister of Tourism India had gone to the hospital, met them, offered to pay the bill, and the fact that we offered rooms in, in, the, in, the, in the hotel, how many people wrote? Pardon? Why should I tweet here? You people are, you, Indian media, Indian media is a street. I'm dealing with an incredibly combatant and nosy Indian media. Why should I tweet? Why should I tweet? Yes. <laughs> Come on. I'm not, yeah, I'm not Donald Trump, okay? Yeah. Order, please. Ashok. Order, order. Yeah, order, please. Order. M M Mr. Minister. The Urban Development Ministry had transferred that Hridaya scheme to the Ministry of Tourism. How are you implementing this scheme? Can you tell us? See, that, that scheme doesn't have any more budgetary support from this year. So whatever is happening, they are going to complete it themselves, the Urban Development Ministry. So that, that scheme has ended. So whatever scheme is going on, the Urban Development Ministry will complete it with whatever is, with the budgetary money which was given to them earlier, with whatever support they have earlier. Well, no, this scheme is finished. That scheme has ended. So, yeah. they will complete whatever is to be completed. Yeah, Mr. Minister, of course, uh, you have already answered my first question. In terms of anti-publicity, you have to develop a strategy to counter that, you know. So you can't be sitting quiet, you have to develop a strategy. My contention is, actually tourism can become a game changer for a country. No, it has. No, <laughs> I, I don't know whether it has or not, but it can become, you know. In, in sense that if you can engage with the citizens in a manner that every citizen 
looks at themselves as a guide or a host to the tourists who come from overseas. Because I know for, for sure, I have a lot of friends who come from overseas and they love to come home and they love to spend time and have our cuisine rather than going to a restaurant. And there are a number of families who may not have friends who would host, uh, be uh, privileged enough to have friends to come over from overseas, but will be very happy to host. So like you have a bed and breakfast scheme and on all these kind of schemes, why don't you identify citizens and get them engaged in terms of your promotion? You no, know, I think the best thing is your uh, homestay programs. In Kerala, it's been hugely successful and uh, it's succeeding very well. So these are the kind of things which we need to, I mean, we are promoting in a big way, uh, the homestays, because there are millions of homes lying vacant and which are excellent places. And there are also, if you come to Kerala, for example, you have these massive homes where just a couple stay and you have five, six bedrooms free and it's all beautiful green all around and it's amazing cuisine. Yes, lots of them are doing that and doing very well. Pardon? Yeah, okay. See, we are doing that. Like in my village, day first day I had, a, I had a tourism seminar exactly on this to promote more homestays. So we are doing it. Now this has to be, you see, basically, Government of India Tourism Ministry is a, just a facilitator. The real work must be done in the states, by the state governments, by the tourism, like in Kerala, they also have the District uh, Tourism Promotion Council, DTPC. They're doing an amazing job. So all these things must get decentralized. Each panchayat corporation must say, wow, we want this to be known as the best city. We want people to host them. So these are things which need to be decentralized and uh, go down there. After all, Kerala is God's own country. Punam. Uh, what are the plans for uh, the infrastructure upgradation, both transportation and accommodation, you particularly for the budget tourists? Yeah, now, transportation wise, I think the tourism minister, the transport minister has done an amazing job, Gatkariji, against an average of about, I think, four kilometers per day, which was being constructed earlier. Today, we have reached 25 kilometers per day. We have spent on infrastructure alone about 15 lakh crores. I don't know how many billion dollars it would be. I can't calculate, let somebody else do the job <laughs> on creating infrastructure in the country. Roads, ports, airports. Take, for example, India's airports. You take the Delhi, Bombay, uh, Bangalore, and Hyderabad airports. I think these airports are more beautiful than any other airport in the world. I can say very authoritatively because I've been traveling so much. These are incredible airports. Like I was in Bombay airport this morning. I was awestruck when you walk through that, the kind of artwork which is there on the walls. Oh my God, it's incredible. I mean, this is, you don't have airports like that anywhere in the world. It's fantastic. So we have a lot of infrastructure, but there are places we need more infrastructure. Take, for example, on the Buddhist circuit. We are trying to create it. We are creating it. We are, going to, we are spending the money. Like, that's why I said I have 68 projects in which I'm spending money. Plus, you see, all the other ministries when they invest money, like the Civil Aviation Ministry. Basically, that's a huge investment in tourism. So uh, the Udan scheme, which has taken tourists right across to the district uh, headquarters and beyond. So all this is money which really actually is investment in infrastructure on infrastructure for tourism. And of course, we need to spend more money. I think this is where I want the states to come on board. Many other states are not spending enough money on tourism and they must spend more money. See, we have a problem with the we, we, we have a problem with the with the with mid mid segment because we need something like two hundred thousand rooms more in India, the mid segment. So we need a whole more more stuff like the like the hotel complex near the airport where you can get a room maybe at three thousand rupees, two thousand rupees. That's a slightly higher end, but a slightly lower end. So we need massive investment in the hotel in, uh, industry. Um, and this is where uh, we want people to come in. Minister, uh, Her Excellency, the High Commissioner of Sri Lanka is with us. Could you expand a little bit on the Ramayana Trail, how it will connect with Sri Lanka? What your plans are? Your Excellency, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, uh, the Ramayana Trail, I must say, uh, in fact, the Ramayana story, uh, 
uh, is or has not been a big store in Sri Lanka. You know, like in India, I think from the time a child is born, you talk about Ramayana in the school and it goes on. But now uh, we have realized that there's a lot of interest, especially in India, uh, on, uh, on uh, seeing the, the places, the, uh, the historical connections. And uh, we have developed some sites and we are still discovering new sites where you know, certain incidents have supposed to have happened. And, uh, and uh, we are, that's an, uh, an area that our tourism ministry is looking at and focusing to develop the Ramayana Trail. And also recently I saw in the newspaper uh, where I think some trains are being organized. Uh, you know, you go to South India and then connect to Sri Lanka, the same tourists. Uh, so that's something good, but uh, actually I don't have much details. But uh, that's something that we could work together. Sure, something that we could work together, of course, uh, on the Buddhist circuit, I want you to bring, I want you to bring me uh, the entire Sri Lanka here because we are developing it in a big way and uh, so these are some of the areas where we need to work uh, closer together. Yes. Yes, anybody else? Yeah. Minister, adding to your comments about this remark, I'm asking, uh, did, did you made any study regarding on that, how it affects or like what is the after effect of that uh, report? <coughs> See, these statements are completely, completely baseless. These statements are completely irresponsible for a global agency which speaks about credibility. I think this, this calls into question the credibility of these agencies themselves. I think, of course, it affects me very badly. It does. When an agency like that puts out a news, it, it's a news agency. It goes all around the world. I've seen it all over the world, front page, right up, which is hugely hugely improper, inappropriate, unethical, immoral. Yeah, Ranjit. Uh, so, uh, can I ask And you, you, you do this just because it's India. Yeah. So, can I ask you about the Shabarimala airport? There's a lot of interest in <coughs> tourism in that area, pilgrimage, etc. So, there's a lot of expectation that an airport will be built there. See, we have a problem there. Since I, I was the MLA there, I know, I know the problem. We've identified a land, but unfortunately, that land is in dispute. It's in dispute. It's about 2,118 acres of land belonging to an organization. Now, government said, sorry, this is government land. And uh, so, I think the so it is ended, ended up in a litigation between that organization and the government, and therefore, we are unable to proceed further. No, I think the court has pronounced... Uh, the no, court. what the court pronounced was... An IAS officer, a district collector was appointed as a special officer to look into this whole issue of legitimacy of the title of this organization. And that officer came out with a, with a report that, that the transfer of property to this organization was illegal and therefore the land originally belonged to the government and therefore the land belongs to the government. And the government issued orders based on that. What the High Court said was, Sorry, a special officer is not the legitimate authority to decide titles. So he said, you go to the court. Now what is going to happen is, then you will start the entire litigation off on the sub-court. It will go up to the district court and then of course to the high court and then to the Supreme Court. It will be stuck for 25 years. Now, day for us, when I was in Kerala, I tried to call up the organization. I'm still negotiating with them. I had one round of talk with the chief minister. Uh, he suggested something. And uh, on the basis of that, I'm trying to negotiate with this private party how we can come to a compromise uh, settlement pending a decision by the court. Because now, you have a problem. Government cannot pay one rupee and acquire this land because the government claims it's a government land. Now, as far as the private person is concerned, he can't just surrender it because he says it's his land. So somebody has to decide. So what the chief minister decided was, we will... Um, pay up this entire cost of the land as determined by an arbitrator in the court. As in when the, when the litigation is f finalized, this money can be either paid to that party or it should be returned to the government. Now, I was trying to negotiate these terms with the other side, which is the Believer's Church, uh, but I have not been able to meet the chief. Uh, uh, he was abroad, so I was not able to meet it, but I am still trying to find a solution. Yeah. 
Uh, Mr. Minister, this is Shubha Jyoti. I'm, I work for the BBC World Service. Uh, which service? BBC World Service. Okay. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, the country from which most number of tourists come to India is Bangladesh right now. And the figure is gradually increasing every year. They have recently toppled the US from that position. Now, my, uh, but the Bangladeshi tourists, I mean, um, they spend relatively less compared to the Westerners. Now, my question is, what is the emphasis of the tourism policy of your government? Do you want more Western tourists to come, more heavy spending tourists to come, or the focus is on just number? I don't care for the color of the skin. That's the last thing on my mind. Now, what you said again is not true. Bangladeshi tourists come and spend a lot of money. They come to India basically for two things. One is for shopping, marriage shopping. They spend a lot of money. Second is medical tourism. In fact, very large percentage is medical tourism, where they come and spend very good money here. So Bangladeshis, let me tell you, are very good spenders. I am very happy. Bangladeshis, please come, more of you. Yes, yes, absolutely. I don't care if it's a white man or the black man or the brown man who comes here. As long as they create jobs for me, as long as they bring money for me, as long as they end up saying, yes, wow, India is beautiful, I'm completely game. I'm Pardon? No, no, no. This is Bangladesh is coming from there with pre appointment for medical tourism, for operations and treatment. Yeah, nobody just walks into India for a treatment. These are not people falling ill here. Sorry, no, no, no. Let me clarify. These are not people falling ill in India. They have a medical problem. They have a medical problem, so they come to India because India, Indian doctors are fantastic and Indian hospitals are fantastic. It comes at a fraction of a cost of what is available in the Western countries. And let me tell you, even in, the, in a place like the US or UK, very large number of super specialty doctors are Indians. And we are extremely competent doctors and hospitals. Minister, the uh, e-visas which we introduced and expanded to now up to 150, I think there has been a dramatic increase in the number of tourists who are coming because of this. When are you going to make e-visas applicable to all the countries in the world? See, we have now 164 countries on the e-visa. We are, will be very happy to add countries to that list. We have no problems at all. We are subject to the, the security and integrity of the country. I'm just qualifying, okay? And that's very fundamental. So we are allowing. And India has the easiest visa regime in the world today. You make an online application and your visa is, on, is in your box in 24 hours. Where else do you have a visa regime like that? Today one of the ambassadors in a meeting where I just came from was saying, my country doesn't, have a, doesn't require a visa for Indians. But conditions, you need to have an American visa or a British visa or a Canadian visa, then you will allow an Indian to walk in there without a visa. I said, very, very funny. Yeah, it's very interesting. I said, uh, you allow my people to enter without a visa, I'll allow you. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it is completely mutually agreeable. I have no problems at all. So and of course, we are, we are making things much more easier. As we go on every day, something new is introduced, like when you come on a cruise shipping, as a cruise tourist, we have even done away with um, your uh, biometric. So we made things much easier. Today, people just come in and walk out. Of course, there are airports in the world where you don't even have to go to the immigration counter. You just walk through. But uh, I guess those are countries with much smaller numbers of people and, uh, you know, much lesser number of people uh, passing through those airports. I mean, eventually, I'm sure we'll come to all that. I mean, technology is fast catching. Yeah. So, Runeep Sangha from Pata. I want to make just two points. There was a question about how is the ministry communicating, in a sense, um, the injustice of sorts in terms of incidents that take place in India? So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Pata with the Ministry of Tourism and FCC had a media meeting earlier this year in the month of March. Several of you were present. Thank you very much for coming. But do carry the story back to your uh, publications uh, so that it reaches the ultimate tourist who has, wants to come here. Uh, and we plan to do that again with the Ministry of Tourism and FCC later in the year. And uh, if the minister is available, we would welcome his presence as well. But uh, we'd like to see more numbers from FCC and the media community attending such Thank events. you, sir. I'm very happy you said this. India is a perfectly safe place for tourists. 
Mm. I'm no doubt. I travel around. I travel. And I'm, I'm traveling 25 days a month. I go to all the remotest corners. Wherever I see people, I talk to them. I do. Oh yeah, I just don't sit in there and come back. I go to talk to a lot of people. India is perfectly safe. And of course, we are trying to make things better. I mean, every day we are trying to do things better. But look at the kind of initiative this, this country has done. During the past four and a half years, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, this government has done more in four and a half years than what has happened in 65 years. I'll just give you figures in half a minute. 75 million toilets constructed. 45 million LPG gas given to the poorest of the poor people. 300 million bank accounts opened and 2,60,000 crore, I don't know, in terms of dollars and billions, I can't say. Go and multiply, please. Yeah. I'm bad in maths. I've got a horrible head for maths. 260 yeah, lakh crores passed on to the people, direct transfer. Electricity to the last village in Manipur, and then of course we have declared this year we have provided in the budget 16,000 crores for f providing free electric connection to every poor family. It's not poor electricity, it's not uh, free electricity, free electric connection to every poor family in this country to a free 12 rupee accident insurance. You pay 12 rupees and you get insured for 2 lakhs. Where else in the world do you get that? You have a uh, uh, life insurance for 300 rupees a year, you have a life insurance, where else in the world you get that for every poor person? And now you have a medical insurance, where the government pays 5 lakh. You can go to the Porsche Hotel, you tell me, let me take the country which writes all these, uh, from where most of these stories originated, the US. How many, how many percent of people don't have insurance there, can't walk into a hospital? How many? Today, Every poor person in this country can walk into, into a hospital. These are dramatic changes this country has made. And if Thomson Reuters or anybody else refuses to see this, what can I say? I won't say it's out of ignorance. No, it's malice. Sir, uh, India is a long-haul destination for most parts of the world. Uh, somehow competing countries uh, around India uh, tend to offer visa fee free entry into the into their respective countries can this be considered for the summer season when tourism is at a low um, the uh, the visa process is of course no doubt very very smooth but uh, it would encourage people to come and it would create more jobs and livelihood for people during the year well i would be very happy if, if uh, visa fees is abolished I will get more tourists, hopefully. But I, I don't really think it's a big part of our decision making because the fee, visa fee is very little. Really very little. How much is it now? $50? Now it's raised to $80. Yes, right. Yeah, so it's a, it's a... It's very little. You take the visa charges for uh, Europe or for the US. Two big markets. It's exorbitantly expensive. Yeah, so you compare that to India, it's, it's so, much, so much less. But of course, as tourism minister, I would be happy to have much less rates, but I think Indian rates are very cheap. As of now, it's very, very cheap. Yeah. Well, <coughs> yeah, you're talking about the lean season. It's a very good suggestion, and I'll I'll put it forward to the to the to the people concerned. Yeah. I will. Well, that's about. <coughs> Pardon. No. See, your restaurants are charged five percent which is one of the lowest. It was 18%, we took it up, it was brought down to 5%. So your restaurant has only a GST of 5%. The only segment in which the taxes are high is those in which the rooms are above 7,500 rupees. That's a luxury segment. That's where you have 28%. We have written many times to the finance ministry to lower this to competitive rates, which is applicable in Southeast Asia. We have written to them many times and we are taking it up on a continuous basis. And we are hopeful that someday it will be lowered. I take that one second. No, sorry. I don't ask question. No, I don't ask. When you clubbed the Ministry of Civilization and Tourism together, it was earlier like this, so you have had more smoothness. I have written my question. Sir, you don't, want me to, you don't want me to lose my job, isn't it? No, no, I want yes. to have two jobs. <laughs> yeah, uh, friends, that uh, brings uh, the meeting to an end. Thanks very much for coming. Minister, uh, this is a gift for you.
specially there is designed. <laughs> there is a plastic inside. <laughs> so this is specially designed for the 60th anniversary celebration. Oh, wonderful! Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm most grateful. Looks beautiful. And uh, I have a couple of uh, so announcements. So every morning when I drink the coffee, I shall remember the lies, the right, fake. Yeah.